Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Um, and all right, good morning for some, afternoon for others. Welcome to the EGLCC's 2022 Black History Month program. My name is Sean Franklin. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I'm the vice president of the Stakeholder Engagement Center here at NGLCC, also co-lead of the Communities of Color Initiative Committee, or better known as COCHI. Uh, for those of you who may not know the Communities of Color Initiative, it is a place where our minority LGBTBs ease can have their voices heard and bring business leaders from a range of industries and backgrounds to work together, share best practices, and foster success. Today's program is focused on empowering Black LGBT entrepreneurship through wellness, financial, and affiliation. It will consist of breakout sessions to talk about the importance of staying healthy, overcoming financial barriers, and local and community affiliations. We will also have a small panel discussion um, to discuss hurdles and challenges both our LGBTBEs and corporate partners face on a day-to-day -day basis and learn about their intersectional heroes. We will close with uh, uh, a fireside chat with Joy Crump, executive chef at Foodie and a recipient of the NGLCC Community Impact Grant in partnership with Grubhub. Before I move further in the program, there are a few housekeeping rules. If you're not speaking, please put your, uh, your phones or your, your Zoom on mute so that we don't hear any background noises. If you haven't done so already, please go to the three buttons in the top right corner of your screen and rename yourself and add your pronouns so that we will know how to address you. Please, please feel free to use the raise hand feature or chat box if you have any questions. And finally, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show as we hear a word from NGLCC's co-founder and CEO, Justin Nelson. Hello and welcome. My name is Justin Nelson. I'm the co-founder and president of the National LGBT Chamber of Commerce, and I use he, him, and his pronouns. And on behalf of the NGLCC and our Communities of Color Initiative, I wanna welcome you to this exciting conversation. And while we're hosting this, during Black History Month. Our focus is on doing our part to support Black futures as well. I wanna personally thank our co-chairs, Tiffany Keaton and Earl Folks, and our NGLCC team leads, Alicia Green and Sean Franklin, as well as our partners participating today, Paul Ashley with BMS, Rose Hatcher with Viacom, and Anissa Jackson with American Family Insurance. I also wanna thank our affiliate chamber leaders, Marquita Thomas with the Los Angeles LGBT Chamber of Commerce and Jason Ray with the Wisconsin LGBT Chamber and our Vice President of Affiliate Relations here at NGLCC. Thank you all for the work that you do each and every day for powering the NGLCC network and for being a part of empowering black LGBT entrepreneurship by supporting your wellness, financial opportunities and affiliations. Throughout this milestone year for NGLCC, we'll be shining spotlights on how we'll continue to fight for equity for our BIPOC LGBT business owners and the importance of working with coalitions and in solidarity. Thank you so much for joining us today and for standing with us in our work to make sure that business is welcoming for each and every identity at Black History Month and always. The NGLCC is working for a nation and an economy that celebrates all of us and affirms that in fact, black lives and black LGBTQ plus lives matter. Thank you and enjoy the program. Okay, thank you, Justin, for those words of encouragement. Um, really appreciate it. And now I'd like to introduce our Kochi co-chairs. Uh, we have Errol, Errol Folks Jr., who uses the pronouns he, him. He's the president and CEO of Center for Black Equity. And Tiffany Keaton, who uses she, her pronouns, manager and supply diversity program global services at TIAA. Earl, it's all yours. I just want to say what a wonderful opportunity and a pleasure it is to participate in this um, Black History Month event. Uh, the Center for Black Equity, we work to improve the, black, the lives of Black LGBTQ people around the world and the focusing on health, social, and economic equity. I believe if we take care of the economic equity, we can take care of the social and, and health equity. So making the money and bringing the finances and making a, play, a level playing field for everyone 
is the key to success in changing our world that we live in and making things equitable. If I may take one moment to explain something, uh, to say something, my nephew, who was 15 years old, asked me the other day, how come Black History Month was only 28 days or 29 days some, some years? And he also asked me if I was at the first one. Um, so he hasn't reached the, uh, the age to realize the differences in ages and that he was insulting me, although he didn't mean to. And I explained to him that the reason why they're only the Black History Month is in February is because Carter G. Woodson, a, a Harvard trained um, historian, decided in 1925 that black history was not being taught to black people. It was Negro history at the time. And this was a, a black history week was established so that black folks could understand what the contributions we made to our great nation and to the world that we live in. In 1976, President Gerald Ford changed it to a black history month. And that's, and so and the reason why it's black history month is February is because February is the month that um, Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass was born, was, were born in. And actually Frederick Douglass was born in February and died in February of, uh, of a different year. So it's important to understand why it's not that we're being insulted as this is, was done for a, a particular strategic reason to honor these two people who uh, contribute to the emancipation of black folks in our country. I hope you have a great session and I look forward to hearing the results from this. Thank you. And good afternoon, good morning. Um, I am Tiffany Keaton. Um, thank you, Earl, for sharing that. I have the distinct honor of working with Earl and the NGLCC team on the coach sheet um, and at TIAA. And I only have one message uh, for those of you on the line, and that is to please go to our website and register to become uh, a prospective supplier. I am, and so is my team, very interested in learning what you do, um, inviting you to participate in upcoming opportunities at TIAA. Uh, we have incredible leadership um, in our new CEO, CFO, CAO, and COO. And so we are committed to business diversity, especially among um, the Black, Indigenous, People of Color communities, and the LGBT. So please do come over to TIAA.org, look for Supplier Diversity, scroll all the way down to the bottom of the page, and register um, as a prospective supplier so that way we can have future conversations. If we don't know that you exist, we can't do business with you. Thank you so much, and I do hope you enjoy this program. Alicia, back to you. Thank you so much, Tiffany and Earl. Tiffany, thank you so much for letting the suppliers know what to do in order to get involved and to just be prospects. You have to sign up. Um, and Earl, thank you for your history lesson. That is really knowledgeable, um, the purpose for this wonderful month. As mentioned, my name is Alicia Green. I go by the pronoun she, her, and I'm the Director of Supplier Diversity at NGLCC, as well as co-lead for the Communities of Color Initiative. We are so excited to bring to you three wonderful breakout options from our theme, Empowering Black LGBT Entrepreneurship Through Wellness, Financial, and Affiliations. We have six wonderful presenters that will be conducting these 30-minute breakout sessions. As we only have time for you to participate in one, do not worry, they will be recorded for you to view later. Once the breakout sessions have ended, we will rejoin to have a town hall discussion with these, with these wonderful presenters. So now I would like to introduce our presenters for our wellness breakout, Kendra Kelly and Paul Ashley. This session will focus on stress management, work-life balance, navigating spaces that marginalize individuals and personal experiences in the workplace. Kendra Kelly, owner of the Resi Resilience Project LLC, certified LGBTBE, based in Atlanta, Georgia. She has 10 years of experience working with at-risk youth, adults, and families. She works primarily with adults with centered services for Black, Indigenous, people of color, LGBTQ individuals, creatives, athletes, and entertainers, and of course, entrepreneurs and business owners such as yourselves. Kendra is also a 16-year military veteran. Co-conducting with Kendra is Paul Ashley. Paul is the Senior Director of Strategic Engagement Partnering and Inclusion, Strategic Sourcing and Procurement at Bristol Myers and Script, Bristol Myers Squibb Company. 
Boy, that's a tongue twister. In this role, he provides leadership for strategic planning and communication across strategic sourcing, global strategic sourcing and procurement. Diversity and inclusion has been a passion of Paul throughout his career. Because of his leadership in this area, he was named the, um, to the board of directors of the National LGBT Chamber of Commerce, where he serves as chair for our strategic planning committee. The financial breakout presenters are Brian Thompson and Anisha Jackson. This breakout session will focus on business cash flow, structure, tax, generational wealth, wealth gap, and ins and outs of innovation. Brian Thompson, founder of Brian Thompson Financial LLC, that is also a certified LGBT business enterprise, is based out of Chicago, Illinois. As both a tax attorney and certified financial planner, Brian provides comprehensive financial planning for LGBTQ entrepreneurs and run mission-driven businesses. Anisha Jackson is the supplier diversity manager of American Family Insurance. Anisha joined American Family Insurance back in September 2020 to launch their program. She focuses on developing a diverse and inclusive supplier ecosystem that is socially and environmental responsible and partnering with other organizations like the NGLCC. And last but not least is our affiliation breakout session. This breakout will focus on importance of getting involved with local chamber, networking, lack, um, to discuss the lack of diversity in chambers and strategies to become more diverse. Marquita Thompson, Thomas, I'm sorry, Marquita Thomas is the executive director of NGLCC's Affiliate Chamber of the Year, Los Angeles LGBTQ Chamber of Commerce. She continues to work for LGBT businesses through business development, networking as as well as legislative strategy incorporating LGBT business enterprises in corporate and governmental supply chains. She is also running for public office in the city of West Hollywood. And of course, the one and only Jason Ray, Vice President of Affiliate Relations at NGLCC. In addition to his role with NGLCC, he is the founder and president of, and CEO of the Wisconsin LGBT Chamber of Commerce. The organization has more than 600 LGBT and allied owned businesses from around Wisconsin. He is also um, an owner and managing director of an LGBT business enterprise, True Compass Strategies, that focuses on strategic planning, nonprofit management, and public affairs. So again, you'll receive a notification box with these three options. Again, these um, breakout sessions will be recorded. So please just choose one and we hope that you enjoy and see you back in 30 minutes. Thank you for being in our uh, breakout session about um, uh, affiliations and the importance of being a part of an affiliate chamber. Um, again, my name is Marquita Thomas. I'm executive director of the Los Angeles LGBTQ Chamber of Commerce. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And Jason, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, Marquita. Uh, good morning, afternoon, depending where you are. Uh, Jason Ray, uh, he, him, uh, vice president of affiliate relations at NGLCC. So responsible for working with our 53 U.S.-based affiliate chambers. And I see a number of our uh, affiliate leaders uh, from our chambers on the call, so welcome. And uh, then also serve as the president and CEO for the Wisconsin uh, LGBT Chamber. And I think, you know, we really want this to be an interactive discussion today. This is not Marquita and I going to lecture for 30 minutes on here's what you need to do. We really want it to be an open conversation to hear from you around, you know, one, uh, what great work affiliates are doing as we work to uplift uh, and and elevate the voices of, of Black LGBTQ entrepreneurs uh, in our communities. Uh, Want to hear what's working, what isn't working, where we can all grow. Uh, but Marquita, I don't know if there's any other opening thoughts that you want before we kind of just open up for a conversation today. Um, no, I was just basically going to say, you know, what we do here at the LAGLCC uh, for communities of color and how we help cultivate uh, communities of color. Um, I will say that for many years, we um, we definitely weren't doing enough. And so this year in particular, we uh, really put a concerted effort towards intersectionality in the L, um, in the, at the LAGLCC. And we launched uh, what we call the Heritage, um, it's, it's called the Heritage Com um, Committee. And that particular committee is tasked with um, acknowledging all of the different um, awareness months, heritage weeks, and things of that nature, because we really wanted to make sure that we were, um, we wanted the 
communities of color in our constituency to feel seen. And from that, um, we started creating um, a lot of really, really great um, programming. Like we have a program next week called um, Why Economic Development Matters. And so we're having our corporate partners and we're having uh, people who have uh, worked in the supplier diversity space, both as suppliers and as executives to talk about why it matters, what barriers exist, and how what are the short and long-term um, solutions to to that so um we've got actually an entire calendar of programming um some of them some of our programming is actual programming panels and town halls and others are um acknowledgements and infographics um but just all in all we wanted to make sure that um everyone in our constituency um felt seen and that they could participate in this programming as well so um that's what we're doing at the laglcc anything yeah, I can share a little bit about one of some of the work that we're trying to do in Wisconsin in specific, you know, and it's one that we've we've had an in, intention. We are uh, nine and a half years old as an organization and really want to be more inclusive um, and to really put that as one of our pillars. So actually starting last year, we pulled together um, several entrepreneurs because one of the things that I didn't want to do as an as an ally to the to the black community, I didn't want to say what the programming needed to be. I wanted to hear directly and have that conversation and support and uplift uh, uplift those entrepreneurs. So we did uh, focus groups to really understand how we as a chamber can better serve. And we saw kind of three main areas come of that. One was really focused on how do we provide spaces for uh, black entrepreneurs to connect and network uh, separately. Not that um, our events aren't great, but they want a space where they can learn from each other, feel supported and uplift one another and have special events. Um, that are focused on that. So looking at that, looking at how do we do specific resource and programming to really help support Black entrepreneurs. And that includes making sure that we have, um, you know, as we are launching an entrepreneur boot camp, how do we define one of the cohorts as a court dedicated to the BIPOC community? But then one of the other big things that we also learned, and I think is an, it was an important one, that, you know, they were asked to continue to do more trainings for uh, uh, our members on how to be a better ally and advocate for uh, the for the BIPOC community uh, in general and for, and for Black entrepreneurs and how to step up uh, and be a voice there. So it's programming for us that's in our initial stage, um, but one that's really important to us as we continue to grow and make sure that we are focused at, on, Marquita, you mentioned on that, that intersectional lens of how do you really support and uplift and be intentional about it. It isn't just about, you know, putting a Facebook post up for Black History Month saying, you know, happy Black History Month, but it's about how are you actually doing programmatic work all year round that uplifts uplifts all voices and really has an intentionality um, that comes with it. That's great. Thank you, Jason. Um, we also have similar programming around um, allyship. Um, we have a um, unconscious bias workshop that we do every year. It's been very, very well received. That's awesome. Yeah, thank you. I don't know if anybody wants to use the uh, reaction button to raise their virtual hand and um, ask any questions or say what you've seen at Affiliate Chambers um, on this topic that you think is really um, impressive work. Very quiet today. I see. I, I recognize some faces and names here. This is not a quiet group in this one. <laughs> I know. I know. Um, I'm looking for the raised hand, and I can't find it. All I see is smiley faces with hearts as eyes. Um, so, bear with me. Um, this is John Henning, Chief Client Officer of Granite Solutions Group. We're uh, a um, Platinum Circle sponsor of the NGLCC and sponsor of the Kochi Initiative as well. Um, you know, one of the things that um, I've been doing a lot of work on in um, in my community and, you know, uh, especially kind of coming out of the pandemic um, is really focusing on collaboration and how to really get to true collaboration, especially in this hybrid environment. And so I wrote a piece last week on trust and building and rebuilding trust and as an ally, um, I'd love to talk about trust uh, in the Black community and 
and its allies and you know just kind of bring this up as a topic and, and understand how I as an ally can help build more trust uh, in the black community and, and you know have a discussion about you know what that means to the black community. Because I really feel like that's kind of at the core of all the problems that we have in this country is not not having enough trust. That's, that's a TED talk. I'm going to see if somebody else wants to before I, I don't want to. Um, Cornelius, did you want to answer that or did you have a separate? Yeah, I mean, I can I can only speak for I can speak. I, I for those who don't know me, my name is Cornelius Joy. I represent the Equality Chamber of Commerce here in the Washington DC area. I am the event liaison and I'm also the secretary for the organization. And one of the things that I would like to say is that one of the things that I would say is one of the things that we suffer with is because we're in DC. So it's harder to get um, more corporate dollars for us because we sit in DC. Um, and the biggest thing as an ally to support your individual chamber is I would say not only put your dollars to it, but actually get involved. And when I say get involved, I mean like come to come to different functions that chambers have. Um, you just get involved more on an involved level, not necessarily just sending dollars. It's okay to send dollars and send checks. But I also said the biggest part to be mainly involved is to actually just get involved and do the work um, and see what it takes, what you see, what's working, what's not and working invite other allies to the different events that other chambers are having. And also understanding what, what each individual chamber needs, whether your chamber needs uh, a black lesbian or a black trans woman or a black trans man, cis man, non-binary, all of that stuff and all that goes into it. I think it's just about having those hard conversations and not being able to approach. I find it often that people are afraid to approach us and they don't understand how to approach us. So they're like, well, I don't know what to say, what's what's right and what's wrong. And I say, just ask the question, then we can direct you on how to support. That's great. Thanks, Cornelius. Uh, I see the next hand I see is Constance. Yes, you can hear me, correct? Yes. We can. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think one of the things I wanted to talk about uh, affects um, every organization or should, and it has a lot to do with what Jason just spoke on. Uh, he spoke on trust and trust is a value. Um, and so one of the things that I think is really important is ethics. <laughs> what has really been torn down in our society are our values and our ethics. We used to be able to get those things from family and other social institutions, right? Like school, uh, church, uh, education, um, sports, uh, all those things fed us and reinforced values and ethics. Um, we had an administration that just ripped that apart to the point where people don't have any respect for um, their elders. <laughs> Um, no respect for any kind of authority. Um, and that's because we've been let down by those things, right? <laughs> um, there is a lack of respect or trust for a lot of people, depending on what kind of organization you belong to. Um, uh, so I think that whenever we start to form new groups and new alliances, that to have a discussion about the foundation that that organization is gonna be built on uh, is really important. And that's where you have that discussion about trust, about integrity, about honesty, about self-esteem of your members, um, about equality, all those, all those values. Um, and there's, there's, you know, values don't have to be religious. I didn't notice I didn't mention chast chastity, right? Uh, values can be um, can be social as well as religious in nature. Um, probably our best teacher about values was one of the prophets. Uh, Jesus did teach us a lot about values, the way in which he treated people the same, no matter who they were, no matter where they came from, 
he preached to everybody and he taught everybody how important it was to love one another, right? Um, so in talking about uh, values, we're setting up a foundation for the organization that it's based on so that everybody knows more or less the rules of behavior within the group. Um, and that's one way to establish equality uh, and to have respect for diversity um, by having values that everybody has in common or that they are at least expiring to. And let's admit, honesty has got to be one of the biggest ones. Uh, it's hard to trust without honesty. And it's hard to be honest without being able to trust. So, um, and integrity is real important. There's a book out right now called, believe it or not, it's called Character Still Counts. <laughs> and it was put out after the last administration, um, 2019, 2020, it came out, Character Still Counts. Um, because character is made up of your values. I think that's, uh, really, thank you. I think that's yeah. a really great point, Constance. And one yeah. that, you know, I'll just, you know, share from what I'm seeing from other affiliates, you know, in that, how you build that trust as well is, and I, I here's my key, if you all have anything similar, you know, in Wisconsin, we sit at, um, it's called the Ethnic and Diverse Business Coalition, but it brings together all of the different diverse chambers from across the state to work together uh, on advocacy, to work together on um, lobbying work, to work together on funding levels, uh, but you know, building off of how Constance phrased it, you know, the only reason we were able to get there was by building that trust with each other, by building that relationship, by being honest about our values and coming to the table um, collectively. So we bring together right now 20 different diverse chambers who are working together to advocate for change within the community and have really seen that be a really successful opportunity uh, because people don't belong to just one identity. They don't belong to just one chamber. Um, how do you work together and really create larger impact uh, together? And it's by creating trust. Um, so that's a really great point. Thank you, Constance. Yeah, and uh, the thing about the book that's really good is it gives everybody an overall understanding of, of about 15 major values that, right. that we should all be thinking about. <laughs> that's um, amazing. Um, yeah. And it was, believe it or not, it's a great book and it was written by a Southern Baptist of all things. Um, but then later I found out that his publisher suggested that he write the book, so. Um, That's great. Well, well yeah. I think we, we'll, all, we'll all make a note to get that book. That sounds like a really great book. Was there anything else that um, people wanted to add to the, the question of how to be a better um, ally? Um, and advocate for the black community. I think- Can I Jay, say one thing? Uh, Jay, um, I'm sorry, Jay has uh, their hand. Uh, okay, his, well, I'll, I'll, and I'll come up, up to you. I'll, 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 come, I'll come right back to you, Earl. Thank you. Uh, Jay? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, um, first of all, hi, John. It's been a while. I think I last saw you in San Francisco and now I'm in uh, DC with the Equality Chamber. But I think that for me, there's three things um, that really help build trust. Um, number one is to create space. Um, what I mean by that is um, authenticity is freedom, right? So the, the freedom to be able to be as black as you want to be, as, as expressive as you want to be, as rambunctious as you want to be, whatever the case is, uh, not having the need to code switch, not having the need to, to put on a front while you're in one space and then change that in another space. So I think creating space to actually allow for all of those shared experiences of, of everyone and all their different intersectionalities and their whole self. Uh, the second thing is being open. Um, it's really apparent when people are have a growth mindset versus a closed mindset or fixed mindset, and they don't really want to learn how to, you know, how people move through the world and all the different things that, that we face that you may be completely oblivious to. So being open to, to learning, but also being open to be called out because it, there's no there's no change behavior without you allowing yourself to be called out and essentially to be vulnerable because we have to be vulnerable damn near every day in, in several different capacities. And then the third and final thing I'll say is just showing up. Um, what I mean by showing up for, for Black people is sometimes we need an advocate. Sometimes we need folks of other experiences to talk to people who look like them on our behalf, on everyone's behalf. And I think that showing up in that way and then recognizing that 
you know, maybe someone that you're working with might be a black person and might not have been afforded the same experiences that someone else was afforded. That's showing up for them also and still taking them uh, and, and recognizing them and their ability to contribute. So those are my three things um, that I think really make a difference for me. Thank, Thank you, you Jay. So much, Jay. Mr. Folks. Um, I, I want to just emphasize a little bit in the showing up because I'm a member of the DC Chamber of Commerce. And the reason why I'm a member of DC Chamber of Commerce is be quite honest, is that I kept seeing them at my events. And it's one thing to say the door is open, but it's another thing to come to my event and say, and bring me to your, their, your event. And when I come to your event, don't just greet me and walk away. Show them, introduce me to the members, make me feel like I'm welcome, I'm comfortable. That those are very simple that we do this all the time when we, people come to parties and we have events and we do social events, hopefully most of us do this, that we welcome, we wanna welcome the people who are showing up and welcoming, come to our, my event, bring me to your event and show me around and make me feel like I'm valued. I will join and that's what we did. That's what my organization did. It was very simple. Great, thank you, Mr. Folks. Uh, Andrew and then Cash and then Philip. Hello, hi everyone. So um, the only, everyone had great ideas, um, great suggestions, obviously. Um, I did like the, um, I forget his name, unfortunately, um, the Granite Solution Corp uh, management team. He uh, did exactly what the question is asked, how, what can you actually do to earn trust within the black community, minority uh, community? Is actually being honest about not knowing what to do or what step to take. Everyone is putting out mission statements, culture pieces. You look on everyone's website now, it has that nice sentiment. It says nice things, but then what do you actually do? Uh, I find a lot of times that companies are really just like, I. they really don't know what to do, how to and you know involve themselves and ingratiate things. So I think that that was a really big topic for us, like being, just be honest about what it is that um, they can actually do to help when not knowing what exactly we do. That's perfect. Thank you so much, Andrew. Uh, next up, we have Cash. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm really interested in, in finding out a little bit more information. Uh, and one of the, the things that I've seen here recently is the lack of education. You know, I think somebody um, touched on that just a bit, um, whether especially with pronouns, right? Um, there are a lot of people who really cannot wrap their mind around it. They have a difficult time. Um, and so I think that one of the things or one of the things that I've been working on in my area, so I, I run um, a nonprofit and that is based in New Jersey, um, but it's to financially educate uh, those in the black, um, brown and Latinx community and especially primarily children. And so one of the things that I'm working on now is how we do that because of the fact that there are so many, especially young children who are having a difficult time in transition. They're also um, not really, they feel as if they're not accepted, right? Or that they're not respected because of the fact that they may be uh, a cis female who, who chooses, you know, like myself to use, um, who prefers masculine pronouns or vice versa, right? And so um, I think that a, a big thing right now is the education of other people. People, even in this time of 2022, there are still so many people that have not wrapped their minds around the fact of the, you know, we there are certain companies that have this diversion and inclusion statement right? But they really don't fully understand what this means. They also don't understand how important it is to a person who is a member of the LGBT community. So I think that that is one of the biggest things. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm definitely looking, for, um, looking to partner or find out some more information about how we can continue to educate people um, effectively in, in this matter. Great. Thank you, Cash. Next up, Philip. Yeah, I'll try to be short and sweet. Uh, I just want to speak to the importance that we show up as complete individuals in our communities, beyond whatever our job is, whatever beyond whatever our chamber is, that we're showing up as advocates in some of these huge issues that are going on around us. 
I've given testimony three times to our state legislature on some of the horrible pending bills that we're facing in Missouri about gagging teachers and voter ID and other issues that are very much a part of the concerns of the black community here. And I, I show up and I think that the two reasons that where I, I wanted to raise it here, one is the relationships that we have as individuals go beyond whatever title we might hold with our local chamber and people need to trust and see us beyond those events. And two, for our own education and awareness, which I think definitely then comes back and expands the work we do through our chambers by our increased awareness and knowledge. So thank you. Thank you, Philip. I'll actually add um, a couple of um, words on my own. I, this has been said, I've been scribbling notes. There's so many great things were said. So thank you to everyone who came up to the stage as it were and um, contributed. Um, the one thing I will say is that um, language is really important. And I know that ally is, is the common is a common word. Um, I know that for me in building trust with me, you know, allyship is voluntary, right? So if we go to war, our allies have the option of you know, going to war with us or not. And so I'm not interested in an ally, someone who can decide whether or not they want to opt in to the fight. Um, I want, and I don't even know what the word is. Some people have used words like comrade. What are some of the words that you've heard, Jason? Anything more forceful than ally? I, I, the one I've heard is just advocate then is the other one that it's you're actually taking action that you're advocating and not just passively sitting there saying you're an ally along the way. Right. And I and I actually take a little bit of issue with advocate because like I'm an advocate for water conservation, right? But That's sometimes I take thing. a pretty long shower. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> I advocate for a lot of things. So uh, for me I'll tell you the line the phrase we use on the protest line is co-conspirator. Yes, I like that word too. Ooh. So Part I, partner partner Part, yeah, partner works partner. too. So for me, um, part of it is just starting with language. So building trust um, with me as a, as a Black individual starts with language. So I like more forceful language than ally, because as soon as I hear ally, I'm thinking, you know, maybe you'll opt in when it's time, maybe you won't. Maybe you'll speak up at Thanksgiving dinner, maybe you won't, because you have an option and it's voluntary. So for me, it starts with language. So that's that's number one. And then, you know, it's, it's everything. Like, how are you showing up in totality? So as a corporation, you know, what are your philanthropic efforts? Um, what is the composition of your board? What is the composition of your talent? We know that 33% of, resum of resumes are thrown in the trash um, if they have ethnic sounding names. So I wanna know about the unconscious bias in your hiring practices. Um, I want to know if you speak up on social justice issues outside of the month of February. Um, you know, we're black all year round. I don't know if people know that, but you know. Black people exist in March. Um, so, you know, like is your is your marketing is is your marketing diverse? Is your website diverse? Um, are your do your efforts extend beyond the the um, the American population? So people feel like, well, black people make up 14 percent of the American population, so they should make up 14 percent of this and 14 percent of that. Well, why just 14 percent? Are you extending beyond that? So that's that's how you build, you know, trust with me. Are you stopping right where some arbitrary number of well, they make up fourteen percent of the American population, so they should make up fourteen percent of our board, of our talent, of our this, of our that? Are you extending beyond that? And you know, I want to know about your reporting. What exactly are you doing? I, you know, it's great that you want to make an effort, but I want to know year over year what has been the fruit of your labor. And so. Um, those are just that's that's just some of my you know bullet points on and you know in basically um, increasing trust. And somebody asked what I was running for. I'm running for West Hollywood City Council, which by the way, I'm the first black person to do so. And I need to be the, the first black person to win. Um, <laughs> so John, you've got your hand up, and I think we've got like four minutes left. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say thank you very much for everybody that contributed here to to my question, and it's um it's it's so important. I think. Um, vulnerability is is the key, and uh, I love um, uh, you know I think it was uh, 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 you know Jay that said um, you know just being open to you know saying I don't know, and that's 
And that's what I was trying to do here is um, look for, you know, more knowledge about how to, to build trust with the, with the black community. Um, you know, I, I did think of a word, I, I, I agree language is super important. Um, I don't know if this is too much, but what about defender? <laughs> you know, uh, somebody who stands side by side to fight with you. Um, I don't know, maybe this is where I get a little hung up because I don't want to be someone who is in my heart there for the cause, but by my words or certain actions offending the people I'm trying to be you know, advocating for because I don't have the, the right to, to say whatever it is I'm saying. Um, and that's for me as a, as a white man, um, that, that comes up. And I don't know if that's just my white guilt or, or what, but, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that we do as an organization. Um, you know, we have a large uh, 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 footprint in South Africa and in India, our company is extremely diverse. Um, and I'd, lo I'd love to be proud about that and talk about it and report it, but where's that line between reporting and bragging and, and, and actually just showing up and creating awareness? It's, um, it's, it's, it's difficult. You should brag. <laughs> if, honestly, if, if like, for, if 60% of your board is African-American, that's amazing, that's extraordinary. And it shows people that it can be done. It's not so difficult. We hear so much that there aren't more black people in this, that, and a third because we can't find, Jason, how many times have we heard, even with LGBT suppliers, we can't find any qualified people to do the work, which we know is not true. So if, so what you get to say is we found all these great uh, black people for our board, for our workforce, for our supply, you know, um, diverse suppliers for our this, for that. If we can do it, why can't you? Why aren't you looking harder? Why aren't you trying harder? And so I would say brag. Um, I, I don't see anything wrong with bragging. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll do more. I think we're down to our probably last minute or so that we have together. I just want to say thank you to everyone for being part of this. And Marquita and I, started this we weren't sure if anybody's going to join us and i the, the 30 minutes has flown by yeah um, i would just also encourage you know one of the things we hear often from affiliate leaders across the, the country you know they're always looking for people to be willing to serve on their board to be engaged so if you're not plugged in with your local chamber in your market right now reach out we're happy to help connect you would we'll love your voice at that table helping to guide these chambers and stepping up uh, and being active in this i think Marquita, I'm sure we would always welcome great volunteers and board members and others who want to do good work uh, mm -hmm. and, and make good change here. Yeah, this was great. This was an amazing conversation. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Again, good afternoon. Good morning to some of us. My name is Kendra Kelly and I am a mental health professional located here in Atlanta, Georgia. And I will be co-leading with Paul Ashley. Hey. Hey, everybody. I'm so happy to be here. It looks like we have, what, Alicia, should we count down to the, the breakout room assignments go to, to what? It seems like we have 15 in here. There's 22 still left, so they'll be filtering in. So if you All want right. to, you can go on and get started. OK. Great. So, to, so, hey, thank you for everybody for being here and really for prioritizing the topic of wellness um, as you go about your day. We think this is a very important topic, uh, hence uh, dedicating this next 30 minutes to you. My name is Paul Ashley. As they mentioned before, I work at BMS, um, where really our core mission is helping patients prevail over serious disease. So wellness is not only something to my heart, um, professionally, it is personally as well, and we'll get to that. Um, but I'm so glad to have Kendra here uh, facilitating with me. She's going to be kind of the practitioner, and then and then mm -hmm. taking us through some stuff, and then I'm going to be weaving in really some of my personal stories and how I apply it in in everyday life. So we we hope this is of value, and um, you know, let us know if you have. Any questions, um, please, please raise your hand and we'll try to get to them.
But with that, Kendra, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Paul. And as he said, we'll go ahead and get flowing. It may be a couple of people that find their way into this space and we will hold space for them to come in and get settled. But I wanna begin this session with some breath work, some breathing exercises. And this is something that is really helpful and useful as we'll get to the topic of stress management. So I wanna invite you all to, if you feel safe or comfortable, to start to close your eyes or maybe take a low gaze down at the tip of your nose or maybe something directly in front of you. And I want you to just start to notice what it feels like in your body. Noticing your inhales and exhales. Begin to notice and observe, releasing any judgment Maybe replacing the judgment with curiosity. Start to observe your points of connection. This could be your feet on the floor. Maybe wherever your hands are placed. Maybe it is your seat that is holding you and supporting you. Just start to notice these things. As we focus on our breath, I want you to allow any thoughts that may try to weave their way in to settle. Maybe you just observe them as they roll in and roll out. No attachment, no requirement to them in this moment. And just dedicate this moment to you and your wellness. A moment to pause a moment to slow down, a moment to just be. Start to extend your exhales. So allowing them to linger a little bit longer and then lengthen your inhales. So filling up a little bit more, breathing down into your belly, And maybe it's helpful to place one hand over your belly or one hand over your heart just to create another space of connection. Extend the exhales. Lengthen the inhales. Maybe bring to mind an affirmation or a personal statement. Something that allows you to feel validated, supported. And I will offer you one of I am enough. I am free to be me. I am safe in my body. Let's prepare for two rounds of cleansing breaths together. So on your next exhale, inhale through your nose, filling up your belly with air, pausing before you open mouth, sigh it out, slowly releasing the air, allowing the belly to fall. Another big inhale through the nose, fill the belly up. Trace the air through, down into the belly, holding it for a moment. For releasing the air out, open mouth, sigh it out. You can return to your normal breathing. Just notice the differences, any changes, if there are any. Maybe return to the affirmation that you brought to mind or the ones that I offered you. A 
Whenever you are ready, I want you to slowly open your eyes and look up and around your space first to kind of reorient yourself. Maybe noticing things in your space that bring you joy or peace. Something you see or smell, something you feel. Creating some grounding back into our space before you look up at the screen again. Welcome back. Hopefully everyone was able to observe and notice what it felt like just to pause, to slow down in that moment. And as Paul and I present today about wellness, we'll touch on a couple of, of topics to include stress management, work-life balance, really being able to navigate in spaces that don't always feel supportive or safe or validating. And things like breath work can be super helpful in being able to just take a moment to pause and check in with self um, to get clarity on the direction to go and the next steps, or just to bring some honor to the space in which certain feelings and thoughts and experiences start to come up for us. And this is really focused on mental and emotional health, but also, you know, we'll be able to talk about like how these things also resonate with physical health as well. So I want you to bring a couple of these questions to mind and maybe you jot them down. Um, what does it mean? Um, what does it feel like? What does it sound like and look like around you? So we're looking at these senses. What does it look like? What does it feel like? Sound like? And what does it mean for you cognitively to be to be black, to be LGBTQ plus, to be an entrepreneur? Like what are these experiences, you know, and how does the intersectionality of these impact you overall, you know, in the realm of wellness? And so I want to be able to really discuss the different factors of stress and how they show up in this spaces of being an entrepreneur. A lot of the things that create stress in being an entrepreneur include financial stress, you know, being able to create a wage or being able to scale business can create some financial pressures. Sometimes a lack of support can lead to feelings of isolation, stress and exhaustion. Sometimes there are some non-productive narratives these things in which we've been told or we've told ourselves that kind of repeat over in our mind that kind of builds up negative self-talk and anxiety sometimes, as well as just some of the negative experience within negative experiences within certain spaces that don't always allow us to show up fully in ourselves and excel and actualize our goals as entrepreneurs. And so those are four different areas I mentioned financial stresses, um, lack of support, um, non-productive narratives either we've created for ourselves or have been placed on us, as well as just some of the negative intersectionality experiences that marginalize us. And so I want to toss it to Paul and check in when it comes to wellness and showing up in spaces as entrepreneur and navigating through some of these stresses, what's been some of your experiences? Absolutely. Thank you. And first of all, thank you for the breath work. I, I try to incorporate some mindfulness uh, in my day-to-day -day life, but it's nice to have somebody else guide you through it. Yes. You can experience it in a much deeper way. And I hadn't had that in a while. So first of all, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, I say, whether it's my about me on social media or anytime I talk, I say I am unapologetically Black. I'm unapologetically gay. Uh, and I'm unapologetically Christian trying to uplift communities. That's kind of my mantra. And I say, I know how to be each one. I know how to be Black. I know how to be gay. I know how to be a Christian. It's the intersections of those that mm -hmm. caused me and, and many of us the most pain during our lives, um, whether we felt we were judged from the religious standpoint. I'm, sometimes I'm too gay in Black spaces. I'm too black in gay spaces. So trying to navigate all of that takes a toll. Um, and, and it took a toll emotionally for me. 
Um, and that manifests itself both not only uh, mentally, but physically. And it wasn't until 2015 that I had to finally say, I need some help. And so I, I added another layer in terms of wellness and therapy. Um, we have big jobs, whether it's being an entrepreneur or whether it's being a corporate executive, or like I see Tiffany's on the, on the line, whether we're both a, a corporate leader and an entrepreneur. Um, and we have a lot of expectations and a lot of pressure. You know, people say, and it's very true, we have to work twice as hard to get half as much as many of our, our, counterpoint, our counterparts. So all of that just adds to a lot. And the only way that I know I've been able to navigate all of that pressure is to take time out for me. And I actually mm -hmm. block some time out on my calendar, whether it's for therapy, whether it's for, um, I, during, during quarantine, bought a Peloton. So there's my Peloton times, you know, all of those things, but, but they're blocked on my calendar. So, and that way I know I will um, prioritize it. So that's just kind of what, what I've been able to do. It's, it's really just making yourself a priority and showing up for yourself. Because that way you you know you have to fill your own cup before you can pour into others. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I appreciate you sharing that. And definitely, as you mentioned um, about just the physical manifestations of mental and emotional pressures and and um, and stressors, there are a lot of physical manifestations that sometimes people kind of ignore, thinking, "Oh, you know, I'm just I need to move more," or um, I'm just kind of out of shape, but this is just aches and pains, not realizing how a lot of times stress can build up within the physical body and start to manifest as aches and pains. Sometimes even when your heart is racing, exhaustion, trouble sleeping, blood, high blood pressure, um, muscle tension and digestive problems. And so these are some of the actual physical symptoms of stress. And so it could be really useful and helpful to be aware and mindful of like what's happening within the body, especially when you're in certain circumstances and situations. So being proactive and definitely setting aside that time is so helpful and effective. But, and sometimes as an entrepreneur, we get so caught up in having to get the things done, check the boxes and dot and I's across and T's that we just forget. We don't you know, create these transitions from work to downtime. We don't necessarily carve out that time to say, okay, this is where I'm going to stop and be able to engage with my social support system. So even in that um, realm of things, social support, that is phenomenal. A lot of times within entrepreneurship, depending on where you are, you're just in this thing by yourself. You, you it's yourself and maybe one other person, but sometimes you're just in this by yourself or it's just become like with the pandemic, people kind of start to create distance and space for necessary purposes. And so a lot of people start to feel isolated and that can create exhaustion and won't allow us to really show up in these spaces that we're working and, and showing our skills and talents not able to show up in our fullest and best self. So when you think about social support, how has that been helpful for you? What does that look like? And how have you kind of navigated that space for you? So, and, and please people use the, use the chat about suggestions that has worked for you, things you want us to kind of discuss is, you know, we want this to be as interactive as, as possible, but in terms of social support, you know, I've been blessed to have a community of people around me, some of which are on this, uh, in this room, who have, I, I, I'm not in a relationship, I live alone, um, but who have made sure they have surrounded me and have not let me go into some of the dark places that I might have been. When I, I actually uh, fought cancer last year, I had a prostate cancer. And these are the same people that came and took care of me. Um, so, so it's just having those people around and being open to having those relationships because you can't do it by yourself. That's one of the things I learned the hard way. You can't be, there's no such thing as a in, independent strong black man who is just out there alone or a strong black woman who's just right. out there by their own. They have to have some support around them, whether it's 
you know, the family by blood or, or what I found more importantly, especially as a black gay man, the family of choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And definitely, as Paul said, like we welcome any feedback and tips and, and information you may want to share in the chat, but uh, definitely being able to identify who your support system is, is imperative. And that could be a bit challenging for some individuals that may have like estranged, you know, friendships and, and family. And so really being able to step out there and create those connections, you know, can be a bit challenging. Um, that's why like, organizations such as this create like this natural family of choice and associations of choice that can become that support system. A lot of times people have a hard time asking for help and, and that ends up keeping them in this silo, this being this, you know, um, solo, you know, thinking they have to do it all and handle it all. And that leads to exhaustion and sometimes leads to burnout. And then in turn, sometimes leads them to just giving up, you know, leads us to giving up on something that truly is important and imperative to us and could be, you know, super imperative to the community and people that are around us. So being able to really practice ways to ask for help you know, and kind of digging into some vulnerability. And definitely, as you mentioned earlier, like moving into a space of maybe getting professional support can be helpful with a mental health therapist, being able to practice in this non-biased space of, you know, asking for help, identifying ways in which you know that you need support and being able to learn how to communicate that. Yeah, in fact, if I can just add, um, mm -hmm. another thing, sometimes you might have to leave people behind because sometimes okay. people are there for a reason or for a season and everybody's not meant to travel with you everywhere along your journey. Um, if that's not safe for you, if it's not healthy for you. So, so I want people to keep that in mind because I've mm -hmm. seen that way a lot, whether it's a perceived sense of loyalty or because their blood they have to mm -hmm. really you know taking up mental space so that they don't feel they can take time for themselves or their families or you know their business yeah absolutely i see some some tips being shared in the chat box i love it taking solo solo location you know taking that time to just spend time with self is really important there's a lot of exploration that can um, and discovery that can happen, just spending that solo time with self, as well as being able to connect with other people. So a nice little balance in that, okay. And even in, as we talk about support system, we're talking about definitely some, setting some boundaries and parameters and deciding who adds value to our support system in life. And also moving forward to look at like, what are some of those non-productive narratives that we may carry with us? And so that speaks to what you just said. Sometimes we think that we have to keep certain people around us based upon whatever narratives we have about support and family and friends and who has to come and who we need to help and who we need to hire to work with us and for us is really being able to look at what those narratives are. What are those, what are some of those beliefs that may start to create anxiety or negative self-talk? Um, definitely for myself, like as an entrepreneur, being able to navigate through telling myself that I, I wasn't, I wasn't, I didn't, or I couldn't have this opportunity to show up in certain spaces, or I didn't have enough skill set, or I just wasn't confident enough, and just really being very transparent and honest about, like, these are thoughts that are automatically coming into my mind, but how can I challenge these? How can I reframe them in a way that provides me the support and the guidance towards these things that I have identified as important to me? And so, I love journaling and I love being able to sit with individuals and just really get some of those thoughts out on paper. Sometimes we're so bombarded with thoughts after thought after thought after thought and before we realize that we're stressed or we're anxious and just pausing for a moment with some breath work or meditation or just breaking out. You know, I am infamous for a pen and a notebook. I'm not really big on typing. It's something about having some paper and a pen and just really just sitting and writing. 
and um, even with journaling, like allowing it to just be free flowing and not having to be structured and perfect and just allowing thoughts to flow and really addressing some of those non-productive narratives that either haven't projected onto you or you have just started to create, you know, on your own through some of the stress and anxiety of entrepreneurship. What's that been like for you, Paul? So, 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 so yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up because the one narrative that I grew up with and I took with me into probably 15 years of my corporate life is I couldn't be who I was and uh, unapologetically and authentically and be successful. So I couldn't stand up in front of an audience and say, hi, my name is Paul Ashley and I'm a black gay man and I deserve to be here as a black gay man. It was always oh, don't talk about your sexuality. Mm -hmm. Don't be too black. Don't be too gay. Don't, I've been told this, you know, a few times, don't talk about some of your challenges, especially with mental health. Health. Don't don't Mm -hmm. be authentic because, you know, corporate America doesn't want, doesn't want that. Well, let me tell you, you know, I just recently uh, got an expanded role and that expanded role was a direct result of my authenticity and what I bring to the table. So I've been more successful and have had jobs that I've loved and roles that I've loved, my role with the NGLCC, because of my authenticity. So that, and that allowed room in my brain and and space in my life to help support others and help support organizations because I've let that piece go. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you for showing up. I definitely on your journey um, as you bring a lot to the organizations that you work with. So I'm glad that you didn't allow those narratives to hold you back. Um, I saw something in the chat that said, old solutions were not solving new challenges. I love that. Really speaks to like sometimes those old narratives and ways of thinking and doing things may have worked 10, 15 years ago for whatever it was worth, but really assessing like, is this bringing value to me now? Is this working now? Because as we keep progressing we're at new new level you know there's new challenges and so kind of being aware of that um and this person also it was tiffany hey imposter syndrome and perfectionism like especially in the world of media where you see everybody doing quote unquote doing all the things and we're comparing ourselves so social media break media breaks period like just managing your consumption of that so you're able to just see see you where you are without comparing or like trying to align with someone else's definition or path or journey to success yeah i I think if if the last two years and we're not completely out of it yet but i do see a light at the end of the tunnel what the last two years should have taught all of us and no matter where we are in our mental health physical health that we have to create a space for ourselves because if we don't the universe is going to create it for us like like the pandemic did um i struggled during the pandemic because like i said I'm, I'm single i live alone um so that isolation so you know i was at a point especially we, we talk about getting personal help uh, i was at a point in my therapy I, I had gone to only once a month i i had to go right back to weekly just to be able to deal with everything that was going on in the world. And, and I say that to say, whether it's your physical health, because I know I gained the COVID-19, if it's your mental health, I experienced isolation, everything's cyclical and, and be okay with that. So you might be great one day and not great the other. Respect that and understand that. And that's okay too. Yeah. So I see we got the five minutes. So any quick question before, I don't know how you want to end it, Kendra, if you wanted to end it with another kind of activity, but uh, any any question, questions, please, please ask. I love the chat Joy just shared in there. Yep. Things oh, yeah. that were taught. Yep. So it becomes culture and then just, we think we're expected to continue to operate in that way. Well, um, if I may, if no one else is going to speak up, I mean, Paul, first off, thank you so much for your words. I feel the same Mm -hmm. way. Um, I'm based in Canada. And I don't know if you've been following the whole 
trucker protest business in mm-hmm. Canada. And then later on, the I'm just going to say it, bullshit, um, with um, Joe Rogan in the States. It's been tough. And then meanwhile, mm-hmm. I'm working on a black history presentation for a client who approached me last week about black history. And, I'm, and it's like, well, what do you want me to do? It's like, well, teach us black history. I'm like, okay, like there's over 2,000 plus years, like give me a little bit of a focus. Now it's like they're a PR company. And it's like me saying I work in PR in the past. And it's like me saying, oh, if you are my client, it's like, oh, give me PR. Well, what does that mean? What do you want specific? Give me more brief. Yep. And it's just, and I'll be honest, I've been in a mood like for about two weeks now. Mm-hmm. So thank you, Paul. I really it's, appreciate it. I've been thinking about going back to my therapist as well. Yeah. And, and it's also being able to say, and, and I'm not an entrepreneur, so so I get a steady paycheck. So I, I know what I'm saying when I say this, but sometimes you just got to say no to protect yourself, to protect your space. Because I remember after George Floyd, I, I became, you know, Paul the Magic Negro, who could, who could, mm-hmm. and I'm sure many of us who had to talk through what that experience is like. And sometimes I did it, sometimes I didn't, because it just, it was exhausting. My, my boss said, let's go to this protest. Well, just because you got woke up as a, you know, as a, as a non-diverse person, you know, and, and, you know, got religion doesn't mean my struggles for the last 20 years. I'm tired. I'm going to watch a movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. Rose, watch the video and read the book. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So so I know we're getting ready to, to, to end. Any last words, Kendra? Um, definitely just exploring all the options for managing mental wellness, emotional wellness, as well as physical wellness. I know we had some individuals speaking about physical health, um, physical exercise, and so really incorporating that, yoga, social support system, um, grounding exercises, affirmations, um, and also just find something that truly resonates with you. There's so many options out there, but it's all about what truly resonates with you and your strengths and your interests. And don't be afraid to try some things on to see what really, really helps and works. And also reaching out, you know, if there's a need for any professional help with a mental health therapist. And also the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, definitely for anyone that's experiencing any thoughts or um, feelings of suicide or for anyone that you may know that may be also having such thoughts. Um, Because there's a lot of pressures and some people feel like there's no way um, out and they just can't really see a way out. But there's some ways out, several ways out. And I wanna make sure we all be able to connect with someone that can help and support us through. Now, thank you for saying that. It became a a catchphrase um, and I say that lightly um, with the whole tragedy of of the Miss USA person who, who committed suicide, check on your strong friends. And mm-hmm, pe- mm-hmm. it's absolutely right. It's not, you know, check on your strong friends because sometimes we are not okay. And we right. don't Thank feel you. because everybody views us as strong that we can, we should, or have the space or can be vulnerable enough to share. I'm really, really struggling. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So that, that's real, but it, I've enjoyed this. I've gotten something out of it. I, I hope yeah. each of you has as well. Um, and thank you so much, Kendra. Thanks, Alicia and the NGOCC for giving us its space and opportunity. And, you know, Kendra and I are going to talk a little more um, in the panel discussion in what, I, approximately two minutes. Okay. Yes, no, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Kendra. This, you know, I really received something out of this because um, I need to take breaks. Um, I try to just mm-hmm. hold in everything. So I really mm-hmm. appreciate this. And I look forward to everybody coming back into the big group. Okay, while everybody is coming in, um, we're going to go ahead and get started so that we'll have time to get through the discussions and have time for any questions. Um, um, And feel free again to raise your hands and or use the chat feature if you have questions. So uh, Brian and Anisha, I'm going to turn it over to you to you two and good luck. (laughs) Thanks, Sean. It's great to see everyone. Uh, My name is Brian again, he him in Chicago. And uh, me and Anisha are part of the financial group. So we wanted to make sure that we had this time for you to ask us any questions about what you need uh, and provide some sort of resources to make sure that you have the right foundation for setting up and running your business. And so I'm going to start us off, you know, that I, my business focuses on LGBTQ entrepreneurs who run mission driven businesses. 
And the question that I get all the time is mostly about cash flow. How do we make sure that the business is sustainable and profitable and also making the impact that it wants? Uh, and so I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, I'm going to talk about the cash flow system that I like to set up for my clients. It's called the profit first system. And, oh. and so we'll talk a little bit about the problem itself. Uh, for most entrepreneurs, finances are not, not your specialty. So you, you're very good at what you do and have a very specific talent, but maybe running a business or having a business is not what you signed up for. And so a part of what you need is help making sure that your business is profitable and that the cash flow, the lifeblood of the business is actually working for you. Um, and lots of us have seen the financial reporting. So the profit and loss, the balance sheets, the cash flow statements, all those are probably like hieroglyphics to you because you don't know them and you don't know how to use them. And so a part of the solution, uh, I'm sorry. And the last problem is most people have the standard gap accounting form of profit sales minus expenses equals profit. Um, that is great. And it's been the lifelong uh, strategy that most people have used, but it doesn't account for the behavior and our ordinary behavior. So this new system is we try to make sure that we set it up in a way that actually takes into account your behavior. Um, we all have the focus on looking at our bank accounts and making decisions based on that. And so instead of trying to fight that, we leverage that behavior. We set up a cash flow system that has separate bank accounts for the different varieties, uh, for the different varieties of transactions that you need to make. And it allows you to make decisions by simply opening your bank account, looking at the balances, and making the decisions that you need to. And why this works is because if you have specified what money is for which purpose, uh, it allows you to use that money more efficiently. Uh, the analogy that I like to use is having the toothpaste container. You know, when you have a full amount of toothpaste, you use as much as you can, and you're not worried about spilling in the sink or anything like that. Um, but if you have that little amount left, you make sure to get every little bit, squeezing the bottle, making sure to turn it a certain way, it's the same that you'll do with your operating expenses. If you know that you only have a certain amount of money to use, you'll make sure that that goes the length that it's supposed to, so you don't run out of money for the business. And if that's all lumped in one bank account, you don't know what should be used for profit, what should be used for tax, what should be used for operating expenses and those types of things. And so we wanna give you a method that actually makes it easier for you to understand that. And so the, the approach that we use is sales minus profit equals expenses. We take the profit out first. So if you are automatically making sure that your business is profitable from the very beginning, and a part of that is saying, all right, so I'm going to set aside 5% of my income for profit and make sure that I leave the rest for expenses. Um, we'll also talk about operating expenses and tax, but um, making sure that you're using and making your business profitable first, rather than um, waiting till the end after you've spent all the money in the first place. And we have specific percentages for each thing that you want to to accomplish. So profit, we talked about owner's compensation, making sure that you're paying yourself enough, you're paying your taxes. A lot of business owners always get in, in trouble with taxes. And that's what I started my career as, as a tax attorney. And so most people came to me in trouble. And um, my goal is to make sure that you don't get into that, into that trouble in the first place. And then the last bucket is operating expenses. Again, we make sure that you have this amount of money to spend on running the business, but then also know that the other aspects of your business are taken care of. So the business doesn't become a, just a cash eating monster and you review. Uh, we adjust quarterly to make sure that your percentages are, are good and what you want them to be and make adjustments as you go along. Um, and this is sort of what people's structure would look like. Um, sometimes 65% goes to operating expenses. We have ideal percentages based on the size of your business and the size of revenue. Um, I don't have time to go over all of those, but I'm happy to share that with um, the slides as far as what an ideal percentage would be for your business size, but it's just a pie chart and we're making sure to split up everything the best way that we can. Um, and so how it works is you deposit all of your income into an income account. There's five different accounts. You have your income, your profit, your owner's comp, your uh, tax, and then your operating expenses. And all the money goes into your income account. On the 10th and 25th of a month, we establish the, the percentages that you then separate into each account and the transfers are done on the 10th and the 25th and that's it. And every quarter you dis distribute 50% of that profit to yourself and then also uh, pay your quarterly tax payments. So everything is set up on a structure in a system that you know exactly when the money's going out, you know exactly what the money is used for, and you can see it just by opening your bank account rather than actually having to run certain reports. 
and I know this, I'm sort of rushing through it because I only wanted to use five or 10 minutes so to make sure that I can give you some sort of feedback, but um, here are some key takeaways from the last part of this, making sure that you have uh, progress, not perfection. This is a new muscle and it's something that you need to get adjusted to. So if it doesn't fit or doesn't work perfectly just to begin with, that's okay. It's a part of really just making the effort and taking things one step at a time as the next uh, bullet points suggest. Um, we're looking at right, what's right in front of you and making sure that you're taking the next right step. And uh, if you need, we have guides. There are plenty of Profit First professionals that have set up this system and set it up for many businesses. So you can reach out to us and make sure that you're on track and keeping on track. Uh, so that's my quick spiel. Uh, I will, we will save the questions for the end um, and I will pass that to Anisha. Awesome. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, as, as we see, uh, Brian has laid out a very nice case on having us understand our capital um, and our assets and, and what that requires and in our, in our income and revenue and how, we, how do we get there and you know, how do we be, pay our taxes and things of that nature. Um, and so what I want to talk with you about is essentially providing ways to get that capital. Show me the money. You know, how do we, how do we get to that capital, right? Uh, so I'm going to share out with you a quick presentation, share my screen, and um, as Brian mentioned, we're going to go over questions here at the end. Um, but I want to talk real quickly about our supplier diversity program here at American Family, um, talk a little bit about our access to uh, these opportunities that we have to help fund businesses from our MBE Cybersecurity Preparedness Initiative to our Institute for Corporate and Social Impact and our Free to Dream campaign. So real quickly here, I'll talk about our supplier diversity program. Um, here at American Family Insurance, we're one of the 13 lar largest uh, property and casualty insurance groups, up 22 spots in 2021, ranking 232 on the Fortune 500 list. Um, here at American Family, our products primarily are, are sold through our exclusive agencies in 19 states. But when you become a supplier to American Family Insurance, you're not only serving American Family Insurance, but our entire group, um, all of our operating companies, which includes Connect, uh, powered by AmFam, formerly Am Ameriprise Auto and Home, The General, Homesite, and Main Street America. Each and every one of those companies you would be doing business with from our staff AUG to claims and so forth, all of our departments. And so last year we launched our supplier diversity program in Q2000, uh, Q4 of 2020. And we focused last year on developing a very diverse and inclusive supplier ecosystem that is socially and environmentally responsible. So for this year in 2022, we wanna continue that same momentum. However, we wanna provide meaningful economic impact opportunities for diverse owned businesses, especially in our underserved communities and historically have not been essentially identified and provided with equitable opportunities. So one of the initiatives we started last year, we started working with the North Central Minority Supplier Development Council. Uh, and we, we essentially hosted uh, minority business enterprise cybersecurity preparedness programs, um, talking about and discussing how our diverse suppliers can be IT cybersecurity prepared and be educated in the space. As you and I know, there are several uh, cyber attacks happening on a daily basis uh, and really understanding what that means and how you as a business owner can protect yourself. In addition to that, we are looking to fund a number of minority owned businesses this year through the NCMSDC to offer additional um, services um, for our next campaign phase, which would allow minority owned businesses and BIPOC owned businesses working with our IT cybersecurity company, Black Kite and Elastistito, current cybersecurity additional offerings, assessments, guidance, uh, and other opportunities to keep your businesses safe. This is something that we are very passionate about at American Family. Um, our, actually, our IT uh, group, enterprise group, is leading the webinars and sessions, and we're bringing on many different folks to educate uh, minority-owned businesses in this space and BIPOC-owned businesses. So um, definitely encourage you to sign up for some of that programming if you have a chance. And also, just plug real quickly, we are also currently doing a free initiative with the Women's Business Development Center, along with the Wisconsin Procurement Institute for additional three-part cybersecurity preparedness programming, which will also include Black Kite. 
The next piece I'd like to talk to is our Institute for Social Impact. Um, our website here is listed and I'll drop it in the chat as well. This is a group formed under our DEI and our Inclusive Excellence Department. Uh, last year, American Family Insurance uh, announced their Free to Dream campaign initiative, committing 150 million, excuse me, over 105 million dollars over the next five years to close equity, equity gaps, build health, sustainable communities, and fight for social justice. Uh, this financial commitment includes grant awards to nonprofits, um, programmatic partnerships with for profits and non for profits, as well as equity investments in social entrepreneurs. The focus areas and investments and partnerships include workforce diversity, equity, and inclusion, our criminal justice reform, education and health equity, climate resilience, and economic empowerment. Uh, so, this is a really big initiative here at American Family Insurance and ways that we're looking to work with BIPOC and and LGBTQ owned businesses. We also announced last year a revolving loan fund. This was a new program announced um, that we are working with uh, and that's going to be administered by the Urban League of Greater Madison and Milwaukee. Um, it'll be funded by American Family Insurance and we will provide those loans to new and emerging minority owned businesses located in the Madison New South Side Hub. So these are a few of some of the initiatives that we have coming out um, from American Family Insurance, working with our supplier diversity program. Uh, we definitely have a lot more initiatives coming over this year uh, that I'd love to share um, as we finalize those uh, programs and um, initiatives. But I do want to save some time here at the end, as Brian mentioned, we want to be able to answer any questions, concerns, or comments you have as part of our presentation. We're in a small group, so um, feel free to just unmute yourself and ask your questions. Um, or if you feel better putting them in the chat, that'll be fine as well. And then you hear Taj development. Thanks guys for um, being here. I got a question. You, you um, broke down the five accounts and I missed one. <laughs> so I sure. have four, the income account, an operating mm -hmm. account, payroll and taxes, right? Yep, and then profit is the last one. So the income account, so you just deposit into those accounts as needed per, by percentage or, or, so we have, I have an, uh, I've been using my operating account as the income account and mm -hmm. then a separate account for payroll and taxes. Mm -hmm. But that was as far as I had went. Yeah, and I, I applaud you for at least getting that far to make sure that you have separated accounts for those types of things. Most entrepreneurs that I see have one account and have everything coming out of that one account. Oh, it's too confusing. I, it Plus is. Plus, I always it's, end up spending the payroll and the taxes when I do. Exactly right, right? And so this is why we separate those things. Because so you know that once that money's gone in the operating account, it's gone. And right. so the, the way that you set it up is all of your income goes into the in income account. Every transaction, every check, everything that you get goes into the income account. And that's all that account is used for, just holding income. And then on the 10th and 25th of every month, you make the allocations that we talked about. We say, if we want 5% to go to profit, we want 50% uh, to go to taxes, or sorry, 50% to go to owner's comp, 15% to go to taxes, and then 35% to go to, uh, to operating. You make that split on the 10th and the 25th of every month. Every account gets its money, and then you use that money until the next transaction, the next 10th or the 25th. So, so you just leave in the income account what enough to keep it open, or does that, because that doesn't, how, I'm not, so here's what my confusion is. Okay. So let's say that um, my monthly expenses is 10K, mm -hmm. and I make income, right, for that, that month at 20K. Mm -hmm. And my um, payroll, because I'm a general contractor, my payroll is two, twofold. One is employee, and then the other is subcontractors. Mm -hmm. So let's say my subcontractors are getting three, three K, and my employees is at twenty five, right? Mm -hmm. And then my operations for the month is so you know I'm not a, hold on, I'm, I'm going fast in the my brain. Thirty five. That's <laughs> at thirty five. So yep. my and so that's thirty five out of the twenty, right? Mm -hmm. And then we've got, 
after I finish everything, I got 2K left into the income account, right? How does that work? If I, if I say my profit for the month, for my profit margins, you know, back in the day, we used to say we were on profit to 20, 25%. I had a CFO told me to mark up everything 100%. I was like, man, I'll go out of business. <laughs> I won't get any clients, <laughs> right? So, um, but if I do like 5%, which is for government contracts and corporate contracts, that's a reasonable amount if you're doing million dollar works. That's mm -hmm. A profit margin. So if I'm doing a 5% profit margin and I take that out and put that into my profit and I still have 2K left for the month in income, how does that work? So your income will be, your income account will be empty on the 10th and the 20th of, of each month. Okay. Okay. So if you're saying I'm going to put 5% in the profit on the 10th of the month, 5% of whatever's in the income account goes to the profit account automatically. Okay. And if we say, oh, well, we want to have I forgot what percentages you were using it. I think it was 30 or 20, uh, 30 percent for operating expenses. 30 percent will go to the operating expense account right away in the 10th of the month. And you can have separate buckets for contractors and for, I mean, there doesn't, just doesn't have to be just five buckets. Um, I okay, think these yes. are the fundamental five, but you okay. could have a contractor bucket. You could have a bucket for payroll, um, which I do quite often. And all that money from the income account goes out to the percentages that you allocate and then you use that money until the next round on the 25th. All the other income that's coming in from the, between the 10th and the 25th is just sitting in the income account. You don't use it. You only use for- Can you have a zero balance in the bank? It's, yes, you can, especially wow. depending on, on what type of bank or bank account that you're using. Um, yeah, it's a good question like, how do you set this up? They're separate accounts, right? So you have five separate accounts at least. And uh, usually, if uh, a bank is only worried about the aggregate balance in the accounts rather than the balance in each account. So one last question. And in the profit, is it is it better to have in the profit uh, 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 for the account is a savings or an investment account than just, uh, you don't want to put that in a checking account, right? Uh, it's up to you. Uh, lots of people have it in savings or it can be a checking because you're going to distribute that profit to yourself. Uh, the, uh, at the end of every quarter. So that profit is a bonus to you. And you use some of that to save for the business emergency fund. That's why I said half, right? Half the profit goes to you, half of the profit goes to the business emergency fund until you build that up to a substantial part that you would like it to be. Thank you so much. I like you for saying that the profit goes to me. I yep. really like that. That's for you. It's to celebrate you and your, the risk that you're taking as an entrepreneur. That is so great. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your questions. Is it Latera? Hello, yes, you pronounced it correctly. It's Latera. Um, thank you for your time today. And I wanted to ask a question about choosing a financial institution. Um, I read Profit First a couple of years back and was really excited to implement it for my business. And it turned out that the bank that I was working with was not a good fit for the cash management system. They just, they don't allow a lot of automation um, and it was really difficult to navigate their website. And so, you know, my question, you know, what experience do you have with banks that are a good fit for this type of cash management system or what features should we look for in a bank? Great question, and a question that I get a lot as well. Uh, a part of this is uh, making sure that you're at an institution that doesn't charge you fees for having money in, charge you fees for different accounts. So the bigger banks like Bank of America, Chase, they'll charge you money if you don't have a minimum amount. Those banks are not good for this. Uh, credit unions are very good for this type of system because they allow you to set up as many credit, uh, as many accounts as you'd like. For my clients, I use Relay Bank, Relay Financial. Uh, it's, 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 a bank that's an online bank that is set up for the system itself. Um, and so it allows you many, many, many tools, um, including being able to set up bank accounts quickly, being able to set up the account quickly, being able to transfer money between each accounts at the same time, um, allows you to separate and uh, join with other accounts. So if you have your main account, your main personal account at Bank of America, you can still link the two accounts, do your profit first, uh, process through that first bank or through Relay Bank and then transfer that money that you need for your profit or for your owner's comp to Bank of America. It's very easy, very seamless. It also integrates with QuickBooks. 
Uh, if you have an accountant, if you have a bookkeeper, it integrates with team members. Uh, it's, it's one that I use myself and that I use for most of my clients, Relay Financial. Fantastic, thank you. Sure. Great questions, anyone else? Hi everybody, uh, thanks uh, Sean uh, and Anisha and, and Brian for all your time. I was wondering um, for, uh, for small business owners and potential business owners starting as like a, you know, a, a company of one, uh, are there any sort of tools or apps or tech or even orgs to join that you have found especially helpful for um, entrepreneurs at that level? Um, and if possible, any Chicago centric recommendations of those? Should I take this one or? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so hi, Brian. It's good to see you. Uh, so with new entrepreneurs, I definitely recommend starting with the fundamentals. Again, talking about cash flow. So the book Profit First is, I think, where you should start. Also, uh, uh, the author of that book, Mike Michalowicz, has a great marketing book called Get Different um, because there are different aspects of your business that you're going to have to run. Um, so if you focus on foundational things like bookkeeping, uh, getting some sort of bookkeeping software set up, either QuickBooks, Wave, Gusto, uh, making sure that you have a foundation around cash flow, profit first system. Um, and then also looking into things about business structure. Every business st structure, depending on the type of your business, you want to make sure to research uh, what is going to be best for your type of business. So whether it's an S Corp, whether it's an LLC, um, whether it's just a sole proprietorship, all that stuff that you need to look, to look into. Um, and there are plenty of resources. Um, I, I write for Forbes and I, on my blog, I just have plenty of resources that allow you to sort of sectionalize what you need to look up and what you need to look to. And also, um, the NGLCC has, uh, a lot of different variety of things that you can look at. And, uh, I think have being in a group, uh, an LGBT, LBG, LBGTQ chamber of commerce, uh, whether it's the one. Uh, that you have uh, in your city. So there's a Chicago one that I'm a part of, um, but then also you could go to the national, they have resources and a lot of things that help you become a better entrepreneur and the things that you need to think about um, right at the very beginning. Because again, uh, I know that a lot for a lot of entrepreneurs, the running of the business is not their strong suit. It's having that talent and having that skill, but learning how to set the foundation is super important, especially at the very beginning. So. And uh, Brian, I would just add to that too. Great question. Um, I touched a little bit about some of the cybersecurity initiatives we're doing. We're working with small business. I would highly recommend you um, take a look at the three-part series. Um, we talk a lot about businesses starting from the ground up or you know, from corporations that are currently doing business multi-million dollars. How are you going to protect that investment? How are you going to protect your, your customers that you're serving? Um, free um, opportunities online for you to kind of learn more about that cybersecurity piece. Um, definitely encourage you to, to take a look at that. But one thing I didn't discuss uh, that you brought up in your question, I'm in the process this year of forming a supplier diversity agency council with American Family Insurance agents that are diverse. Uh, currently, they don't have a certification for uh, diverse agents, whether you're independent or not. So we're going to be working with some organizations this year um, to kick off what that process could potentially look like. But I would also encourage you to look at risk and how risk would, uh, would um, affect your business, what you're trying to go into. Are you going to have a storefront? Um, you know, how are you going to protect yourself from, you know, insurance um, issues that may come upon um, from customers who come into your business? Those kinds of things. Um, I think get missed from um, entrepreneurs who are just starting off because they don't think about that long term, how that's going to affect that profit that you want to be able to keep and transfer into your other account um, instead of having to pay out claims. Um, so definitely would encourage you, um, we'll, we'll be posting more on our site about the insurance agency council that we'll be creating. And then they too will have American Family Insurance agents speaking directly to entrepreneurs like yourself to talk about how you can better protect your, your assets and your dreams. That's all really great information. Thank you so much. Hey, hi, I need you. I, I don't know. Somebody, I don't want to talk a lot. Somebody else hand this way before I say this. Go ahead, Crystal. Okay. Oh, 
Oh, hello. <laughs> hello. I was I wasn't sure if you all were uh were, were speaking to me. Um I really, really appreciate all the information that's uh, been given to all of us today. Um, I will just uh, second a lot of the information that was uh, shared uh, by Brian with respect to um, profit first and that ideology and allocating those funds and then having separate accounts. Um, oftentimes, it's been my experience, I've um, a lot of my clients have gone through it and I also went through it. And, um, building and trying to grow out my business and trying to figure out and I'm still trying experiencing some growing pains trying to figure out how to properly scale and um I think it may be a little easier with a retail business to do that whole uh profit first um um you know allocation and everything it becomes a little more complicated when you're more in a service-based business and your income is very unpredictable um so it, it it just becomes a, a little bit more challenging, but it's certainly uh, doable. So um, I definitely, definitely recommend uh, sitting down and putting together basically a budget and stuff for your business and taking the time to actually plan out those expenses. And um, the insurance piece is also a very big part because that is something that's often overlooked and is very needed for the uh, small businesses that's growing, looking to grow, and also protect themselves because everything you're working for and towards can be very easily compromised um, with a with a claim. So I didn't have a specific question, just uh, some comments on some of the conversation that was having today. Thanks, Crystal. And you're right, a lot of great nuggets have been dropped today. Um, and uh, Appreciate it. Anybody else? I know you came into this room. Is there something that hasn't been discussed that's on your plate or been on your mind that you want to ask uh, these two? Go ahead, Latera. It's me again. Um, I was curious if anyone knows of any national entities who are offering um, financial or legal support for diverse entrepreneurs other than those who are on the call right now what might be some other places we can go to get that kind of support you know i to answer your question tara um i know a lot of my peers in in the industry a lot of support diversity professionals are offering many different um, areas to cover that. Um, if you're doing business with Facebook, for example, I know they have an initiative with the invoicing, will they cover uh, the, that way the diverse business will get paid uh, and not have to wait whatever the payment terms are coming from uh, the, the supplier they're working with. Um, I would encourage you to look at, um, like for example, the NGLCC and MSDC, um, they have um, industry groups. Mm -hmm. I'm part of the FSRSD, the Financial Services Roundtable. Um, we give away scholarships and provide other opportunities for BIPOC and minority-owned businesses um, in some of the areas that you're speaking on. If you go to the ability, it's FSRSD.org, um, you can find out a little bit more about that organization and what we're doing to provide the initiatives that you stated as well. Um, and then I would encourage you to look at some of the supplier diversity web pages out there. A lot of the programs who do have those initiatives will have them listed on their website and how you can take advantage. Just waiting to make sure everyone is back. Um, I apologize in my room, we got caught off at the end, but great conversation there. And, and I'm, that's what we are about to do next is kind of go over what was talked about out um, in each of the uh, breakouts. And uh, so I am going to turn it over now. So um, let's go on into our panel discussion. Um, we've already met all of our panelists. And I'd like to introduce today's moderator for the panel. It's Rose Hatcher, Director of Supply Diversity with Viacom CBS. Rose has oversight of Viacom CBS's Supply Diversity Program, 
where she is responsible for driving strategies that increase supply chain inclusion and business relationships with diverse owned businesses across Viacom CBS's portfolio of brands. As an award-winning leader and, and recognized ambassador for diversity in talent and supply chain, Rose is excited to bring together a nonprofit advocate organization resources to support the full spectrum of supply chain management services at Viacom CBS. So welcome everyone, Rose Hatcher. Thank you, Sean, and good afternoon, good morning, good day to everyone. Um, if you are in a breakout session, I hope you got fed. Um, I was in a great one um, with the wellness and I'm looking forward to hearing what was discussed in the financial as well. So we, um, since the panelists have already been introduced, we're gonna jump right in so that we can get some more nuggets. Um, let's start with the entrepreneur leads and um, have them introduce themselves to the larger audience and talk about what happened. Um, you know, give us a brief summary of what happened in your breakout session. And, and Kendra, let's start um, with, with the wellness session. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, again, I'm Miss Kendra Kelly. I am a mental health therapist here in Georgia. And within our wellness panel today, we talked a lot about stress management tips. Uh, we we're able to discuss a little bit about some of the things that impact levels of stress, being able to recognize symptoms, whether it's mental, emotional, or physical. And we got a lot of really great dialogue around some of the challenges about being an entrepreneur, being a Black entrepreneur, being an LGBTQ plus entrepreneur, and ways in which we can recognize when we can ask for help or when we can create support systems that allow us to continue to show up in these spaces and to navigate away from burnout or shift if necessary, and just to really take care of ourselves as we continue to operate in these spaces. Thank you, thank you, Brian. Please share with us what was discussed in the finance breakout. Hey y'all, uh, Brian Heham in Chicago. Um, we focused on some particulars, at least especially for my part of the presentation, we focused on the cash flow of the business, how you set it up correctly, how you operate it to make sure that the business is both profitable and impactful in the way that you want it to be. Um, we talked about the profit first system, how you set up five different accounts, uh, make sure that specific percentages go to your profit, go to your operating expenses, go to your owner's compensation, and go to your taxes, and how to actually function that, that process to make sure that you understand what's coming in, what's going out without having to run any financial spreadsheets. Thank you, thank you. I'm, I might have to go back and watch that recording as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sure there's, there's much to learn and we don't always think of tax last. So that's what grabbed me for that. I think we think of that um, a little higher up on the scale. So um, let's make sure that we're including our affiliate leaders. So Marquita, share with us what was discussed in your breakout. Thank you. Uh, we had a, a pretty remarkable conversation. Uh, there was a question posed to of how to be a better ally and advocate and inspire more trust in the black community. And there was so many, there's so much great feedback um, from putting dollars to action, creating space. Um, you know, making sure that your corporation has uh, good social ethics, uh, showing up and connecting Black entrepreneurs to decision makers, being honest about not knowing, um, using more forceful language than ally, because allyship is voluntary, um, increasing diverse talent, uh, increasing um, more, uh, having more diverse representation on your boards, um, making sure that people have uncomfortable people address unconscious bias. It was a very, very long list. It was a, an amazing session. And I really encourage everyone to uh, watch that recording as well. Great. And I know Jason was there with you. So Jason, if you feel free to jump in, if you have something that you'd like to add, we'd love to hear um, what, what, your, um, what you took away from that session as well. So um, feel free. Well, thanks, Rose. I, I'll be really brief because I think Marquita really hit it on, on the head for us. And it really was a remarkable conversation. Um, and I really thank everyone for bringing the authenticity to it as we really work to engage um, and, and be uh, better affiliates. Great, great. So, you know, while, while we're on the topic, um, you know, with the affiliates, 
um, share with us, how do you incorporate wellness and fitness into your current roles, both personally and professionally? And, you know, uh, Marquita, please share with us. Sure. Uh, fitness or finance? Both. Okay, great. And uh, not or. <laughs> wellness and fitness and finance. Okay. Um, so we have um, a, an affiliate group that we call FLAIR, which is finance, legal, accounting, insurance, and real estate. And so that's for people who are actually in those industries so that they can uh, do information sharing, share best practices, um, get connected to build strategic alliances and really just um, connect with one another. And so it's a small group, but it's a very powerful group. And there's a level of lead generation and connection that happens in that group that wouldn't happen um, in a larger group with um, in industries outside of that. So that's what we do for the entrepreneurs who are in those particular industries. And for people who are looking to get connected to financial resources, we connect, we um, connect our members to uh, our local SBDC, CFIs, we connect with our banking um, corporate partners to make sure that our uh, constituents have access to capital. So that's what we do for finance and for wellness, we actually created an affiliate group um, of all of our members who are in the holistic space. Um, we and what we do, it's a, it's a three pronged system, we first of all make sure that we promote those members to our um, our constituency and our supporters, because we wanted to make sure that people had wellness resources, especially during the pandemic. Um, we made we knew that that was a really, really important um, aspect of our service to our community was making sure that people were able to have like stress management and just kind of, you know, get centered and um, so that they could, you know, um, they, you know, they were stuck in their houses and people were really having a hard time during the pandemic. So we promoted our wellness partners to our members. And then we brought all of our wellness members together to connect with one another so that they could create strategic alliances. And then we continued the conversation on our Slack channel because we didn't want it just to be a one-off. So we wanted to keep the conversation going. We're also looking to create a holistic fair um, in May because we know that this work is ongoing. We're not quite out of this yet because obviously because we're connecting we're virtually. Um, so we want to make sure like whether it's a massage or just mindfulness, or we even have um, a hypnotherapist. So we have um, a, a range of different people in the wellness space. And so we want to, you know, give them an opportunity to connect with our with our members. Um, and we've also done um, workshops. So we had a workshop, for instance, on the five love languages so that people can better connect with their partners, whether they were romantic or professional, um, because you know that that's part of wellness as well is, is how you connect with people, um, even if it is virtually. So that's some of the work that we're doing over at the uh, Los Angeles LGBTQ Chamber of Commerce. Great, great. And you know, be sure to make sure you put a link in the chat so that the folks who are not connected to the chamber today can really take a look at some of the great things that the chamber is doing. Um, you know, so I think, you know, to, to stay on the um, wellness topic, I wanted to make sure we gave, um, you know, all of the participants on the panel an opportunity to speak. Paul, would you like to share maybe two things that you took away from the um, discussion that you all had in your breakout? Well, yes, thank you, Rose. The, the, the two main things that I took away um, was one, um, I really enjoyed, we actually uh, did a mindfulness practice and breath work that I really enjoyed, especially having somebody else facilitate it. But even if you can just do it by yourself, it really you know helps boost your day because I know that really boosted my afternoon. And, and then the second thing is, and I'm actually gonna th uh, slip a third thing in. The second thing is to, to ask for help, whether it's ask for support from your network, um, whether it's your family by uh, blood, family by choice, whether it's mental health professionals, whether it's you know anyone, you're not in this alone. And, and then the other ones we really talked about the challenges, especially as, um, many of us LGBT people of color um, and, and really the, the added stress. And then you had entrepreneur, business leader on top of that, just to make sure that, A, you're able to live authentically um, and, and really taking away some of that stress and some of um, what, what some of those pressures build upon you. Um, living authentically and in your truth many times will help you let some of that go. So those are a couple of things that I learned. It was a great session. Hey. 
Thank you, Paul. And Anisha, I want to give you an opportunity to share a couple of nuggets from your session as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, we had a great session. Brian led us with some um, wonderful information around, like I said, our finances. Uh, and then I essentially talked a little bit about the initiatives to help you with those finances. Once you start racking in that profit from your entrepreneur or company you're running, you know, how do you, how do we protect our dreams? Um, what initiatives are out to help fund your dreams to provide the capital for you? So I went over some of those initiatives we're doing at American Family from our Free to Dream campaign, which um, we have dedicated over $105 million to many different initiatives to help uh, communities of color, BIPOC. Um, we have some specific um, opportunities out there that are in the uh, Madison Urban League for business owners to gain access to additional capital offerings. Uh, and then we partner with other organizations just like NGLCC um, to provide cybersecurity initiative and preparedness to help protect your company, your customers uh, and your assets. So a lot of exciting information we shared. We also talked about um, other service offerings and other companies out there who provide those types of services. So looking forward to, and um, this has been a great um, program today for our black history and supporting BIPOC LGBTQ owned businesses. Thank you so much, Anisha. And um, um, you know, again, if I sound like a, a PSA, uh, uh, take it as you may, but um, there's some really good um, information that's being shared here by professionals that really wanted to make sure that everyone in this audience had this information. So please, if you did not get a chance to participate, go back and watch the um, videos or the recordings that will be provided. So we're gonna switch our conversation to talk about intersectionality. So I'm gonna go back to the um, business owners um, uh, and well, those I've been sitting through, uh, you know, there are so many different meetings and. Okay, so we're going to keep going and talk to our business leaders about what challenges have you had, both personally and professionally, um, around intersectionality and, and um, what did you do to overcome them? So, so Kendra, I'm going to come back to you. All right. Um, wow. I think um, someone also mentioned this in our breakout. It's just really some of the pressures that are culturally placed about being like a black woman, like being a strong black woman, a strong black man. And some of those non-productive narratives that show up as we're going through life and now in this space of, you know, being an entrepreneur and like, that kind of getting in the way in which we show up or how I've been able to show up to ask for help because there are these um, unrealistic expectations sometimes that are placed there. And so really in having to confront those um, essentially. So the intersectionality of not just being, you know, black and maybe having to meet a certain standard of success based upon what family expects of you and some of the pressures of, you know, being financially stable because of some of the other connections to family. And then you're an entrepreneur, so you're just trying to figure it out <laughs> anyway, especially some of the finances. And so just really finding a balance and how I can show up authentically, but also take care of myself um, and just start to pave my own path of what it means to be successful and, and well and supported as a Black LGBT entrepreneur. Great, thank you so much for sharing that. And, and Brian, same question. Um, when we talk about intersectionality, you know, professionally and personally, you know, what were some of the challenges and how did you overcome them? Yeah, I, I really resonated with what Kendra said to me about, it's about living authentically and learning how to do that as a business owner. And for me as a business owner, that is representative of the business, right? My face is out there, my life is out there. I talk about um, not only my business, but my life and being able to really be authentic and show up as uh, a complex human being. I don't have to be perfect. Uh, I can be, I can make mistakes. I don't have to know everything. And being able to really sit in that discomfort and uh, being able to work through that has been very helpful for me. Um, I, what I've really learned about being an entrepreneur is it's a lot about the internal work, like dealing with uh, my own hangups, whether it's money scripts or whether it's, um, imposter syndrome, insecurity, fear, all of those things that have really gotten in my way about being a genuine 
person and being a business owner has all come to head because it's me making this go. And so being able to have the right network, being able to take time for myself, uh, being able to take care of myself, knowing the proper foundations, all the things that we're talking about today. I'm so glad that we did this because all of these different aspects of the business are so important and they're all intertwined. And so being able to really, for me, it's been helpful to keep the focus on myself, learn what I need to learn about becoming a more authentic person, being able to take care of myself, um, both emotionally, physically, and also spiritually. Um, all of those things have been really impactful in helping me succeed as, a, as an entrepreneur. Great. So, so let's take a different look at intersectionality and talk about our heroes. Are there any um, inter intersectional heroes that you look up to or that you um, have looked up to in the past to help you through any of those challenges? And, and Brian, I'm going to stay with you on this question. Uh, yes. So uh, we each got to submit a couple and uh, mine were Madam CJ Walker and RuPaul both entrepreneurs uh, the, to me the important part about being an entrepreneur what i've learned is uh, it's much easier to close the wealth gap if you're an entrepreneur the wealth gap is 11 to 1 if the, if you're a w2 earner and it's three to one if you're an entrepreneur and so the people that have inspired me have been entrepreneurs and madam cj walker was the first self-made millionaire woman as a black woman in the early 1900s which to me is just mind-blowing that she was um, that successful in a time when she wasn't even thought about a, as a person, right? And uh, that the grit that it must have taken, the courage it must have taken, uh, is just inspiring. And then obviously RuPaul now, uh, <laughs> it's just so amazing how over the, my life, I'm 43 years old and seen, uh, it was so hard for me to come out and to, to feel like I saw people that look like me and saw people that were successful that look like me and seeing RuPaul now just all over the world and people respecting her and him and being able to do everything and anything that um, he wants. It's just amazing to me and inspiring. So there's my two. Thank you. Thank you. Marquita, um, you know, did, did you submit any or do you have any that you want to share? I didn't. I I was having a hard time thinking of anyone, but I, I do have someone. I am utterly um, overwhelmed and fascinated by Harriet Tubman. Um, I realize we only know like such a small piece of who she was. Um, people don't know that um, Harriet Tubman actually had narcolepsy and still <laughs> was able to, you know, free as many people as she did. Um, she was just absolutely fascinating um, woman and people don't know about how after um, after the story, the narrative that they do know that she was a spy and she's just, she's just like, just absolutely extraordinary. And I'm just in awe and, you know, get stopped in my tracks every time her name comes up because I learn something new each time. That's a great one. And um, Kendra. Hey, I didn't submit any, but I'm enjoying hearing everyone's reflections and passion about these individuals in, in ways I, I hadn't really like took the time to really connect with. Um, I think sometimes my heroes become the people I just see every day around me. Um, sometimes just the access to those individuals become, you know, my heroes. And sometimes those are some of my clients that I work with, like literally hearing them navigate through spaces that are challenging as they, you know, show up as all the aspects of who they are, all the parts of who they are. So it's, it's usually the people that are around me and all of you all on this call today, you are my heroes, so. That's so sweet. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and you as well. So I've learned so much from you all today. And um, I'm just going to check in with Alicia and Paul and see if we have a little more time to talk about some more of our heroes. But while I'm waiting to get a message from them, Paul, want to share um, your intersectional heroes? Yeah, I, I picked a few, but the two I'm going to briefly highlight is um, Bayard Rustin and uh, Marsh B. Johnson. And the reason why they are my heroes, and let's start with Bayard, is, you know, one of my strengths is connecting people and through those connections, getting things done. And that's exactly what Bayard did for the movement, for the March on Washington. And he did so 
um, you know, by living authentically and getting a lot of, of, of flack for it and crap for it. Um, and then you have Marsha P. Johnson, who you're talking about being authentic, you know, mm -hmm. was one of the unsung heroes. I think things are coming to light more recently where she's getting her due, but she started the, she was one of the, the, the black and brown people who started the Stonewall Uprising, which led to the gay pride um, movement that we have now. So we can trace our gay pride history to LGBTQ people of color, and that story isn't told enough. So those are the two I want to briefly highlight. Thank you, thank you. And Anisha? Excellent, you know, I had a couple heroes that I wanna talk about, but someone said earlier, um, you know, we have the, the unnamed heroes, the everyday people, right? Our, you know, whether it be our family, friends, um, you know, people who have inspired us throughout the years. I think about definitely my grandmother, um, who is a matriarch in our family, um, and was I, she was one of the first African Americans to go to UMKC here in Kansas City and graduate from the Music of Conservatory here. Uh, and she herself was a Black-owned businesswoman, having and teaching piano lessons out of her home to the community. Uh, and so a lot of of her is in me. So I definitely wanna highlight her um, as part of my hero. Uh, but I also had um, listed Andre Leon Talley. I mean, uh, uh, one, another one of my great heroes. And I wanna read just a real quick, uh, one of his uh, quotes about why he wears his capes. For those who don't know, um, he say the capes for me suggest a great moment. They are very formal and regal. When you are wearing a cape, you are going to behave differently. You are going to stand differently and walk differently. And that's exactly what he did and embodied uh, in the work that he did uh, while he was here with us. Um, just, you know, unapologetically, unapologetically black in everything. Uh, and uh, so I try to embody all my heroes and people who have influenced me throughout the, the years uh, in the work that I do um, and try to be an example for others as well uh, to, to, to leave a legacy um, for um, the BIPOC community. Thank you for sharing that. And, and before we close, I will share that I put in our very own Vernice Armour. Um, we all know her as Fly Girl. And when I think of intersectionality, Vernice, of course, we can see is a Black woman veteran that we don't always talk about, as well as LGBTQ, and still, still was a, has been a trailblazer and, and really a living legend. And I wanted to make sure that, um, you know, she knows that we do look at her as a hero um, in this community and in every intersection that she supports. I don't think she's on the call. Hopefully somebody will share the message with her. And I wanna be um, very cognizant of time because we have more and more great um, stuff to, to cover and we have joy coming up. So I am going to turn this session over to Alicia and thank everyone for your time this afternoon and your participation, whether it was on the paddle or something in the chat. Thank you. And we look forward to hearing from you soon. Wow, amazing. Thank you, Rose. And thank you panelists for this wonderful discussion. Um, I am now excited to introduce to you one of NGLCC's recipient of the Grubhub Community Impact Grant, Chef Joy Crump. Joy is a culinary graduate of Art Institute of Atlanta. Um, and in 2011, Crump opened her, I mean, <laughs> Chef Crump, I'm sorry, opened her first restaurant, Foodie, in historic downtown Fredericksburg, Virginia, with her partner Beth Black. She has appeared on season 12 of the Emmy Award winning competition series, Top Chef, and is involved in the James Beard Foundation's impact programs for food policy, chef advocacy, and change. In early 2020, they were faced with the industry challenges related to the COVID-19 pandemic, where they have recovered and now have opened up other restaurants and co combined foodie and mercantile into a single location. And I would like to just introduce Joy, welcome to this panel. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure and to be here with you. Thank you. And I'm really excited to have you. And just to carry over from the conversation with our panelists, um, do you have an intersexual hero? Oh, man, I, I saw that and I was like, I, you know, I you always go the route like 
oh, my grandmother and my mother, you know? Um, so, you know, those are kind of like my, my, my fierce, like due north that I follow that I, even both of them have passed and I still continue to learn more about what they did quietly, which is kind of what is most impressive about, um, about them to me is, you know, because we are kind of sort of a, a, so accustomed to giving ourselves accolades so that we can, so that we can be recognized and so that we can stay ahead and so that we can stay relevant. But um, so much work that gets done quietly without recognition to me is the stuff that's just so beautiful. And, and so those are the, the people that continue to just like impress me with um, little little snippets that I learn about everything that they had to kind of endure and juggle in order to um, in order to keep it going so yeah. no most definitely and that is what's so shocking is that they are working behind the scenes and you don't know what struggles they go through in order to provide for families or to do their business you know and handle everything so with that being said how did you get started in your business You know, I think that uh, I think that most chefs kind of tell the story of how food impacted or impacts their lives and how it traces back to their family and memories. My family, I have a big family, uh, three brothers and, and, and two sisters or six of us. And my parents were divorced when I was very young. And so um, uh, we were we were in separate locations. And so coming together was was a big feat you know and we managed to do it several times a year but it was expensive and it was time consuming and it was a lot of logistics to work out and so when we got together um really the only activity that we could could justify was like cooking and eating together it was just kind of like that's what we did we didn't go out to dinner we didn't go on vacation we just you know we just kind of gathered and so then that that act of cooking and sharing just became synonymous with for me to with with family and love and just like expressing um you know these these precious moments that we get to have with each other so you know that's my story and i think it's a, it's a lot of chef stories and um um in terms of starting the business uh, my dad died very suddenly in 2011 uh 2010 and that was like i think a trigger to um get off my butt and and kind of do something that felt that made me feel alive and made me feel connected to his sense of adventure. Um, and so that's why I uh, put on a blindfold and jumped off the, the cliff of entrepreneurialism. Yeah. So yeah, so being a black LGBT entrepreneur, what difficulties did you come across starting your business as far as financial? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> excuse me, we were talking about this a little bit when we were kind of going over uh, the, the things for today. And anecdotally, uh, we we have a, a, my business partner is also a woman of color. Um, she's adopted. She doesn't know a lot of her history, but she's she's brown. And um, and we we prided ourselves on having a really kind of like successful business. In, in other words, our P&Ls were right side up and, you know, we were in the black every year and we were growing at a rate that we thought was respectable, especially in our industry. And when it came time for us to, um, to grow in, in a big way, meaning um, stop renting and buy a building um, so that we could kind of control that, that part of our, our finances, um, we hit brick wall after brick wall after brick wall. And we just, we couldn't understand it because, you know, we thought that despite the challenges in our industry, which is very volatile, the restaurant industry, we were continuing to perform and at a really good level. And our, our, our numbers were just growing. And we just went to bank after bank after bank and, um, and got turned down for a loan. And it wasn't until one of the gentlemen who I, I consider today to be a mentor who looks not, nothing like um, like us, you know, he's a, in his 50s and he's a white man and he's, um, you know, incredibly successful and, and, and has his own business. And he took a, he took a really kind of genuine um, shine to us and, and kind of said, uh, you guys are great members of the community and it behooves me to make sure that you're successful. That was kind of his um, mindset. And so whatever I can do, he said, to help you guys move forward, um, that's what I'm gonna do. And he, he looked at our finances and he said, you guys aren't telling the story of what you're really doing. And, and bankers love stories. 
And so we, <clears throat> we, he said, let me, let me get you guys in the room with the people that can actually say yes. You know, and he picks up the phone and he gives us a meeting and we sit in a room and I'm not kidding you within, you know, seven days, we had the loan that we needed and it was, um, sobering and, um, you know, obviously I felt very grateful that I also felt like, what the, isn't that some shit, you know, like I'm, I'm sitting here with this person who, um, has nothing to do with my business and nothing to do with my success, but because he has put his stamp of approval on it. Now the other people who look like him say, okay, I can lend you money. And, um, and we kind of, Beth, my business partner and I, we kind of use that as it woke us up, you know, it woke us up because we were doing the work, but still couldn't get the means that we needed until a white male said, give them the means. And, um, and so that's how we got the, the, the nuts and bolts to actually like go from a tiny 30 seat restaurant, which is what we had where we were the tenants to a hundred seat um, building that that we own half of and, you know, kind of that whole thing. So that, that's how that happened for us. Wow. Um, so, you know, since you went from that small building to a larger size and, you know, you're gaining more employees. So were you able to get, you know, did you ever have to apply for another loan? Were you able to do it, you know, you and your partner by yourself or did you still need that assistance? Um, <clears throat> you know, we had a we had a lesson early on when we tried to get funding to open up a restaurant, and uh, we we went to the small business. Um, we 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 moved to Virginia from Atlanta. We're in Virginia now. We moved to Virginia from Atlanta. We went to the SBA in in, in Atlanta, and we went to, went to the SBA um, here in Virginia, and we asked both you know organizations to kind of guide us along that path. And they said, "You're not going to get the money. It's it's it, it's too risky for you." Uh, for no one's going to lend you the money. And I, and I can understand that at that point, we had never done it. We didn't know what we were doing. Nobody had any business lending us money. Um, we had excellent credit though. So, um, and, and I wouldn't recommend this to anybody, but we, we took um, everything we needed. We put on our personal credit cards and we, um, and we, you know, we built up X amount of debt, 50 grand, and we spent the first three years paying that off. And we actually were able to kind of like juggle it at 0%. And so, you know, on paper, it looked like we were genius, but it was, it was incredibly risky and it was incredibly, um, it, what it taught us was that we're betting on us all day, every day, no, nobody else. Like we we're just betting on us. And so if we can look at each other and say that, you know, we're the ones who have the skin in the game and we're the ones who have to perform at a certain level, then, um, then there's a little bit of comfort in that. It's, it's a little lonely sometimes, but there is a little bit of comfort in that. And so, yeah, we have taken that notion and we've said, um, you know, the, the loan that, the, that our mentor helped us get, you know, we ended up paying it off about 18 months early and we used that, that, that cred, you know, to get another loan for um, another building that we now just own just ourselves. And, um, you know, we, we were, we have been continuously able to grow and self-finance and it is hard. It's really hard. Um, and I don't always love it because especially in times of COVID, when everything is stripped away, you realize how closely woven your personal finances are with the finances of your business. And when one thing is struggling, it puts pressure on the other. And so, um, to answer your question, yeah, we have been able to secure financing. We have been able to grow on our own dime, but we, I feel like we are doing it in a way that is, um, if it all goes away tomorrow, we still have what we need, you know, as individuals personally and financially to, to stay afloat, which is, um, I mean, I saw so many small businesses just like drown because there had no, no disconnect between, um, I mean, uh, restaurants had no disconnect between their business accounts and their personal accounts. And it was like, dude, you're losing your house, you know? So it's, it's, it was, it, it, the lessons are, are coming at us constantly. Most definitely. And I'm pretty sure I'm seeing, you know, the head shake. A lot of these business owners can attest to that, how their business finance, you know, does intertwine with their personal finance. So it's just finding that balance. So speaking of, you know, the pandemic, COVID-19, 
and um, you were a recipient of the Grubhub, um, the grant. Mm -hmm. So I want to know how, you know, what your connections with NGLCC mm -hmm. um, by receiving that grant, as well as how was that, how did that impact your business? Um, I mean, <laughs> it's $100,000, it impacted it massively. And um, uh, okay, so here's the deal with 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 COVID, um, you know, we, we have a team, Beth and I have a team, it's, it's she and, and I, and then my sister who happens to be a financial planner is, um, is our financial planner. And that's really nice because there's a, a level of trust there and she has her own kind of innate understanding of what we're doing. And then we also have an accountant who is a white man. And um, he's incredibly honest and he's done amazing work for us. And he's been on our team for about six years. But one of the things I noticed is that, you know, every opportunity that was out there for some sort of um, support or aid or, or, or grant or, or loan or whatever that was based on um, fact that we were part of an, uh, you know, an underrepresented class or, 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 or a group, we went at, at it unapologetically. We're like, yeah, let's go for that grant. Let's go. We need it. This is our time to get that. And, um, and he was the one who was very almost judgmental about that, um, about, about us going for the things that I don't know if I'm losing my train of thought a little bit, but like almost going for the things that like the other guys go for all the time. Like there's so many benefits out there for other businesses. There's so many um, opportunities for funding, for grants, for tax, um, you know, uh, benefits that we just don't play in that world. And so we don't know about it. But at, when COVID came, they all bubbled to the surface and we were able to take advantage of them. And we were like, yes, give us these things because if we don't have them, we will not survive. Like literally we will not survive. And we, you know, it led to a lot of like kind of painful conversations with this team member, which is like, you can't sit in your office, in your home office um, and kind of have judgment over what we have to do with boots on the ground to make our businesses work every day. So you may not think that we need a $100,000 grant from NGLCC, but we're gonna go for it. And if we get it, it's gonna help us last for six more months. And I don't think that there's, I think we understand that pressure and that reality a lot better than some other businesses and classes of people. Um, so yeah, that, so th this grant was, I mean, I can tell you right now, we bought a programmable fryer because one of the main things that we sell is, is, um, my mother's, uh, fried chicken. And, you know, that was $15,000 and I, I didn't know how we were going to do that. Our oven, which is, you know, another one of the main things that we sell our biscuits, our oven died at the very end of the year last year. And we were able to use 9,000 of it for that. It helped us play payroll immediately. Um, I mean, it was very, it's really tangible. The, the differences that you can see when you watch that little comma come in your bank account that wasn't there before. I mean, it's, it's, it's humbling. Nice. Is there anything you would like to just any inspiration you want to give to those business owners that are having, you know, trouble finding finances or just trying to, trying to stay, you know, positive? Yeah, I think that networking is not, um, I always think of networking as like standing in a room with mucky mucks, you know, drinking white wine and like talking about shit that I don't care about. But really what networking is, is this, and that is just the intersecting of people's ideas and businesses so that we can cross support, self-support, sustain and lift up. And so I would say relentlessly pursue every opportunity to find businesses um, that look like you um, because our dollars are just as green as everybody else. And um, it's, nice to, it's nice to watch that support grow. And then um, the other thing that I think is, is, is important is look at the ones who don't look like you because they're doing it right and you want some of that. And so I'm not, I'm also very proud of the fact that 
um, my mentor happens to be a white male who's performing at a level that I never thought I'd reach. And, and while in some ways the financial crumbs that he drops are what I need, um, I'm cool with that because I need them, you know? And so uh, I look, there's so many things that he does in terms of discipline and how he runs his business and how he doesn't apologize for his quest for success that we use those things to, to mirror, to like bring to our business so that we're not apologizing for our quest for success. No, awesome. And, you know, I'm just seeing all these um, different chats, you know, just talking about how inspirational your story is. So before we go, I just want to do a little fun fact. And again, I just want everyone to know I'm talking to Chef Joy Crump um, in Fredericksburg, Virginia. If you're ever there, please look her up and, in, you know, and get some food. I'm sure it's good. I can't wait till I can go and visit, but just some fun facts about um, you. What do you do outside of cooking? What do you like to do for fun outside of cooking? Um, uh, let me see that. That's, that's yeah. I mean, <laughs> Paul was talking about a Peloton. I mean, like my Peloton is like my coat hanger. Um, uh, I think, I, I think I like to, uh, move my body you know like I like to walk I like to get on the peloton I like to spin a little bit I, I like to be doing something that feels different than um than what I do you know most of my days and, and most of my hours in a day so um I like to I like to exercise and kind of uh and feel like I'm breathing fresh air and being clean um yeah awesome so yeah so exercising after you eat so what would you say is your favorite food that you cook like what would you what's your yeah. favorite dish um, I like anything on the grill, anything, anything, anything. I mean, um, you know, uh, fruit, meat, vegetables, anything that fire touches when fire touches food. I think it's very, um, you know, kind of like primal. And I just, I just love it. I love the smell of it. I love the taste of it. I just, if I could cook on the grill every day, I would. Well, awesome. Do you have any final words? Um, I mean, I just, I, I, I got a lot more out of this 90 minutes than I really expected. And so I'm, I'm super grateful for that. And, um, you know, definitely heavy imposter syndrome being in amongst this company, because I, I kind of think, what am I doing here? And, um, Kendra was fire. I love, I love all that. That was just fantastic. Um, thank you. Thanks for the invite. I really appreciate it. No, thank you, Joy, for joining us. Um, this concludes our fireside chat. I want to just thank everyone for joining us today and joining this wonderful program, Empowering Black LGBT Entrepreneurship, Wellness, Financial, and Affiliations. We hope that you got something out of it as we did. We benefited from it. Again, this is a recorded session. So if you um, have any questions or you would like this recording, please email us or and we will send it out to you as well. So thank you all and have a great rest of your day.